Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to today's Digital Glaucoma Support Group. Thank you for joining me. My name is Joanna Bradley and I'm Head of Support Services at Glaucoma UK. Um, I'm also just sort of, I'm just getting this all set up and we're just getting it launched on Facebook Live. Um, so hopefully people who are watching on Facebook can see us now. Um, so welcome to everyone who's joined us and I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers for today. Rachel Hilton is a glaucoma specialist nurse at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital. Owen Williams is chief executive officer at Welsh Council for the Blind and also has glaucoma. So they're both gonna talk and then after the two talks, we're gonna hand things over to you. We're gonna have a Q and A and we'd love you to share your hints, tips and frustrations or anything you want to say about living well with glaucoma or ask any questions you have. So without further ado, we're going to move on to today's talk. So our first speaker is Owen Williams. Um, he's got the, he's the CEO of Welsh Council for the Blind. He has glaucoma and is here to talk about how he looks after his eyes and his personal experience of living with the disease. So don't forget, if you have questions at any point, please post them in the Q&A. We'll keep an eye on it. We can, um, and, and we may answer them as we go along. We may answer them as the end, but please do. Let's make this interactive as possible. So Owen, over to you. Thank you very much. And as introduced, my name is Owen Williams. I'm the Director of Wales Council of the Blind, and I'll give a little bit of a background to WCB and, and what, what we do. So Wales Council of the Blind is an umbrella body uh, that is working in Wales, and we're a membership organisation, so our members can include local, regional and national organisations that work across, across Wales. We provide Probably one of our key roles and, and how this links very well, nicely into the Glaucoma UK is we provide a range of information uh, and resources to people with sight loss. Um, one of the things that is unique to us is that we're not a service provider. So we are, um, we're not involved with service delivery at the heart. So we can become, uh, we are an impartial organization. So we can give information and resources and signposting and support that's available within the community from a range of organizations. Um, we also chair and organise a, a body, if you like, that's called the Wales Vision Forum, which brings all of the sight loss um, charities in Wales together to look at um, campaigning policies, uh, information that's given out and services and support, uh, and just to really to give an oversight of what's happening and what support is available to people with sight loss across Wales. I'm also the chair of the Low Vision Service Wales Advisory Group, so many people with glaucoma um, if they are unfortunate and have uh, received some deterioration in their vision because of glaucoma might benefit from low vision aids and we're very lucky in Wales that this service is available within the community so within opticians or high street op 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 optometric practices um, and you have a range of uh, low vision magnifiers lighted and, and, and other adaptations that's provided free of charge uh, to, and that's that's a, a Welsh based service only. It's not available, I know, in, in other parts of the UK yet, but hopefully there's some work that, that's being done in Scotland and other areas of England uh, in that regard. Um, I'm also chair of Visionary, which is the membership organisation for UK sight loss charities. So that's a little bit about my background uh, as my professional life and, and having sight loss um, does give me that empathy within the organisation that I work with and, and the people that I support. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about my sight loss. I was born in 1974. I was born totally blind. I had um, no sight in either eye. Um, we had in the 70s, we had a series of power cuts, uh, electric strikes and, and, and the like. So at four months of age, um, my mum and dad, we had a power cut. My mum and dad lit the candles and I didn't turn around to face the light and it was then um, that they realized that I had no sight so as a result of that I went to um, had an operation um, decide well several operations actually they found I had congenital cataracts and glaucoma in my left eye um, and as a result of successful surgery um, I have some very useful vision in my right eye um, I'm considered as partially sighted or sight impaired now um, my primary condition is now nystagmus but in 2015 is when um, I, ha I started to experience quite a few issues with my left eye in particular, which has always been my weaker eye of the two. Um, but I had a detached retina in 2015 and the surgery that resulted led to glaucoma. So my condition is secondary glaucoma. Although most recently um, we're looking to see if, I've, if I actually have glaucoma or ocular hypertension, which is high pressure within the eye. 
but very, very similar in, in the diagnosis. So I take drops twice daily uh, to keep the pressure in my eye down. Um, when, when the pressure was up, it was in its 40s and it, I, I was experiencing headaches. Probably most of you on the call are, uh, are aware of that and, and eye pain and fatigue and blurred vision and, 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 and quite a lot of the symptoms that come with glaucoma. Um, the, the pressures, I'm on COSOPT, which does bring the pressure down and they've been stable touch wood for quite a, quite a few years. That, um, so the hospital done some fantastic work to just keep the pressures down. Um, I put them in the morning and in the evening. It's, um, we've had a, I've also had a range of different bottles, and I, I suppose lots of people on the call will, will 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 resonate with this. So I used to have single dose, um, so you just take the dose during the day. Uh, it's one dose. I used to find that a lot easier because you could just guarantee you put all of the drop in your eye. You you knew that you were putting the right amount in. Um, more recently, I've had larger bottles um, that vary in sizes. Uh, they, they vary in shapes you know how how much do you squeeze in how much do you put in you know depending on the bottle that can be quite difficult i also find that the drops can sometimes sting but again you're all aware of that and um uh, also if you i do find that if i miss the eye and find i haven't put much in i'll wait about 10 minutes and then repeat that dose so with the single doses that can be difficult with a larger bottle that's a lot easier i also find as a patient that um I have the, the lifespan of the larger bottle, as I say, is about 28 days, and yet we have 12 prescriptions per year. So if you, if you do your maths, there's, uh, there's 52 weeks in the year, so there should be 13 prescriptions. So for some months, I find that you're using the drops for 31 days rather than the 28 days. And actually, I find, I don't know if anybody else does, but I find that as I get later into the month, I find that the drops to be less effective. Um, I how do I combat against that then as, as someone? So I do take regular exercise and I do know that that's something that Tacoma UK will recommend. We recommend 20 minutes uh, for three or four times a week. So I do find that I am finding now it's much easier to exercise than it was during the darker nights of the winter, particularly as I have a busy day job. So I'm finding that, you know, in the morning it's not, it's dark when you start work and by the time you finish work, it's dark. So that it's been harder to take the exercise during the winter. But in the in the in the summer months now, um, my fiance and I, Sarah, we started playing tennis. We play squash. We go on walks together. So we try and do as much exercise as we can uh, during the week, which isn't always possible. Um, I'm not a smoker, which does help. I mean, it, 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 for, for those of you who are smokers, I know Glaucoma UK will recommend that you know try and stop smoking with glaucoma. That's something that thankfully I've I've never taken up. Um, I also try and lead a healthy and well-balanced diet. So we take multivitamins. So we have vitamin packs that include B2 and B12. I also take omega-3 uh, and have taken cod liver oil tablets in the past. So it's all just about trying to have a, a healthy balance uh, and a, a lifestyle of, of exercise and, and a good diet as well. One of the things I also find very, very useful, I've, I've always talked to my family, so my fiance as well, but my, my, my broader family about my sight condition. Um, I, I don't hide that. I talk to her, you know, if I'm experiencing headaches and pain, which some, sometimes I get with glaucoma. Sometimes I think it's linked as well to, to my, my sight condition of nystagmus, which obviously if I'm working during the day, I do a lot of screen work, particularly now with the pandemic, we're all working at home uh, and that can be a factor. But I always talk and I'd advise anyone to always talk about um, the problems you're experiencing with your sight loss, particularly your loved ones, um, so that they can understand and support you when but when you need that support. The other thing which is important is to try and avoid stress. So that, that's not easy, as I said, when we're working from home at the moment. Um, but one of the benefits of the pandemic has been that I don't travel now, I work from home. And that has been quite a, quite a tremendous benefit for me. I don't get tired as much as I used to from traveling in the morning and traveling back at night. Um, also, I can get into a really regular routine of taking drops. Um, I can, you know, almost do the same times during the morning and the evening, whereas sometimes I would start work earlier or would have to travel across Wales and leave really, really early. So, so that routine has settled down and, and, you know, definitely been one of the advantages of the pandemic. So within my role, going back to my role, one of the critical um, elements of us as an organisation is, is to provide information to people with sight loss. And, and we can do that. And we do that regularly with Glaucoma UK around the early diagnosis and regular monitoring and treatment. Uh, you know, and as we know, most people will retain useful sight um, if, if, if they are treated early enough. 
Um, so the earlier glaucoma is identified, the more likely it is that vision will remain normal. Um, so those, those key messages we promote and we work with, with Errol Williams, who's our representative across Wales, to make sure that we promote as many messages uh, out to the public as possible. We also have um, alluded earlier to the Wales Vision Forum. So we meet monthly and, and one of the themes is that we talk about eye health care. So if anybody in Wales has uh, any messages they want to give or any concerns they have locally around um, the treatment that they're having, by all means get in touch with us at WCB. We, we have um, representatives from across the sector, so RNIB, Guide Dogs, Site Cymru, North Wales Society, Vision Support, Site Life, and the smaller local societies across Wales um, and Macla Society that, that sit on these groups. Um, and what they will do then is represent the voice of people with sight loss. So we'd really love to hear from you. So if you do have any concerns around treatment that you're having, um, please please reach out to us. And I'm sure Glaucoma UK can share my, my email details. I'm happy for that to be shared. Um, so another thing we do is look at the symptoms that are uh, related to glaucoma and make sure that people are aware of those symptoms. So that can be things like intense eye pain, nausea, vomiting, red eye, headaches, which I've alluded to, I, I've had often and still do experience a little bit uh, tenderness around the eyes and seeing rings around lights which again is one of the symptoms that I, I have picked up um, and blurred vision not one that I could really tell with my left eye my left eye is a poor eye it's it's, it's had you know I, I've not had very good vision in that eye since I was born so it's hard to, to, to see how how much of a difference the, uh, the glaucoma or the ocular hypertension has had on that eye the, the other thing that we do, and I just wanted to mention briefly, is that we, we bring people together. So Glaucoma UK have a number of peer groups across, across Wales and across the UK, but there are also a number of local societies that have peer support groups, clubs and, uh, and societies that, that, that bring people together. And that may be useful that if you want to talk to someone else with sight loss, you can uh, find out who your local society is. And that's something we could help with in Wales or visionary across the UK. Um, I've also been invited, which I wanted to talk to you about briefly this morning, to do a piece of research that's linked in with Cardiff University and Glaucoma UK. Um, and that research is around looking at a newly developed sticker that will sit that will sit onto the onto the glaucoma drops that you use. And that sticker will enable you to see how often you're picking up and using your drops, but also how much drops you put into your eye. So you the, the study will look at are people getting the right dosage? Are they doing it regularly enough? Uh, and then hopefully from that, there'll be a, uh, some technology that can be improved to, to make sure that we are taking the right drops. Um, I know it's one of my anxieties has always been with glaucoma is, you know, am I taking the drops correctly? Am I getting enough into my eye? Um, is it doing the job that I want it to? Uh, and is it stopping myself from having, uh, you know, re reduction in vision that, that can't be um, can't be corrected. So I, I'm really pleased to be part of that study with Cardiff University and, 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 and to take that work forward. And then finally, I wanted just to reflect on some of the work that's being done across Wales um, around the transformation of glaucoma eye care services. So glaucoma services can vary across Wales, but one pilot I wanted to particularly talk to you about was a pilot uh, the piece of work that's been done over the last year, which is about bringing um, glaucoma treatment into the community. And that's been done in Cardiff and Vale Health Board and by five optometry, um, optometry practices in the Cardiff area. Um, and what they've looked to do, and um, this piece of work was funded by Welsh Government, and what they've looked to do is to bring glaucoma treatment and pathways into the community to provide that diagnostic and treatment centre and provide enhanced patient pathways for glaucoma. So patients will be referred uh, and to receive required tests and treatment within the high street. So that's happened um, with a hospital consultant able to virtually review images. Um, so practices have connected to their local hospital's IT system. So all that's been seamless and, and it's been, you know, there's work behind the, behind the scenes. Um, we've had some fantastic success within that, say we uh, within the project itself. They, they've currently seen 1500 patients across the five practices. Um, patients have been seen in a safe environment. Um, you know, and, and, and realizing consultant capacity and clinic space. Because one of the things we are having as probably you are across the UK is, is, a, is a waiting list to get into the, into the hospitals. They have a lot of capacity and demand. Um, so by, by having this as seen within primary care is, is able to release some of the patient lists within the hospitals. So out of the, 300, out of the first 317 patients seen as new glaucoma patients, 120 were required to attend a hospital appointment for treatment. 
So 39% of those patients um, were discharged back to optometrists at, at not having glaucoma. So that obviously saves them going into the hospital. And 23% of patients were followed up in the optometric uh, diagnosis treatment centre. So as you can see from this 1500, a lot were, be, were able to be seen within primary care, but those who had significant need were, were still referred back into um, the hospital consultant uh, for treatment. So that's enough for me for now, because I know time is precious. So that's just a bit of a background to myself and what's happening here in Wales. And I'll hand back to Joanne. Thank you so much, Erin. That was really interesting to hear about your experiences and, um, and some of what's happening in Wales. So we're now going to hand over to Rachel, um, who's going to talk from her experiences as a glaucoma specialist nurse. Over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to try and share my screen if I can, because then I can show you sort of a brief um, PowerPoint that I've got here. So tell me if you can see this OK. Can you see this here? Yeah, yeah wonderful. So I'll, I'll just talk to you a bit about sort of who I am, what my role is. And I guess because Owen set this up quite nicely for, for what he's been discussing, a lot of topics he's touched on are really relevant to the, the sort of things I was going to mention today. Obviously, my side of things is more from the clinician's perspective, but more about um, the sort of interaction I have with my patients and, and what people say to me that they need help with, how I might support them. And hopefully there'll be these common themes that sound quite familiar to, to people who are watching and, and some of which Owen's touched upon. Um, and obviously in the Q&A, we can sort of delve into things a little more if there's specific questions people have. So just to sort of explain about my role, um, in terms of what I'm doing day to day, Really, a lot of it is focused on patient advice, information and support, but that's in a, a variety of different ways. So it may be that patients sort of seek me out, that my number is on a, a leaflet, they've had my card. It might be I meet a patient ad hoc just because I'm in that clinical area. It might be that my clinical team actually refers someone to me because they feel they need that extra sort of support and advice. And when we're talking about that information support, it's a, state, a variety of things. So. I really encounter patients that at all stages, depending on, on when they may need me, it might be that someone is newly diagnosed and you need some support, some support around what that means, what glaucoma is, what their specific glaucoma is, how that's going to affect them. It might be that I encounter them at a later date. They may be struggling with their eye drops and I'm helping them with drop installation and techniques. It might be that it's surgical intervention and they need some help and support around pre and post surgical anxiety and follow up and what it all means and, and any sort of triage of questions, concerns they might have. So it really can be at any stage in any part of the treatment. Um, in terms of how I do this, again, it depends how intensive it is, what the patient really requires at the time. Sometimes I'm meeting and supporting in clinical areas, as I say, in the outpatient clinical settings or surgical areas. It may be that I actually support over the phone, obviously, because of COVID, a lot of that has moved to telephone triage. Um, and as well, it's not just one to one, it may be group settings. We did have glaucoma education and glaucoma support groups running quite regularly until COVID. Unfortunately, they're a little bit on hold at the moment. Um, so it's really in however the patients need it. In terms of the other things that I do, obviously, clinically speaking, I do see patients on the slit lamp. I'm examining eyes. I'm checking that treatment is working, checking intraocular pressures, seeing some of the surgical patients uh, postoperatively. And I do that as part of my role alongside the consultant team. Um, so I do have that, that clinical aspect to my role as well. Um, we also do specific nurse-led things such as treatment effectiveness clinics, where it's more of a nurse hybrid clinic. So I can provide a bit more education and support, have a little longer with patients than my team members of, of consultants and, and optometrists may sometimes have. Um, and that's just for patients often that are, are more newly diagnosed and may need a little bit more education and support. But I also do the clinical examination alongside that. And then we do specific things such as teaching patients to check their intraocular pressure at home um, with a little device that we use. For some patients, we need to know what their fluctuations are like day to day in order to help with the diagnosis. So that's one way of doing it conveniently. And it, it sort of, it's quite nice for patients to be able to do that if they can and, and have that sort of sense of involvement and empowerment in terms of coming to those diagnostic decisions. So that's a little bit about what I do in my day to day. There are other things that were involved 
similar to, to things that Owen was discussing with regards to research and education and, and service developments and so on. Um, one thing just to note about um, research that might be of interest due to COVID is we're actually working at the moment on an app. So obviously technology as that's developing is becoming used more and more frequently. And because of, of big waiting lists and patients waiting longer to access us, particularly now with COVID having a, created an even larger backlog due to not being able to see people as frequently as we'd like because of all the restrictions. They've obviously started looking into different ways that we may be able to monitor patients at home. So there's always developments like that going on. And this current um, app is something that will allow us to monitor how well patients are, are actually seeing in terms of their sensitivity of vision, contrast, and that will just give us a sense without having that visual field as to whether there are potential changes there. Um, there's also the benefit of being able to do this alongside apps that will be able to take images of optic nerves. There's the eye care device that I was mentioning where you can check your own eye pressure at home. And all of these things that are slowly getting developed and, and tested may help in future for more frequent monitoring. So those types of things are, are always in the works. In terms of what I'm doing with the patients, just to kind of move on to those common themes that I was talking about. I've tried to split this up on a couple of slides into different sort of categories, really. So when we think about education needs, um, I would say that education is a huge part of living with glaucoma because you need to know what you're dealing with in order to be able to you know, be involved in and, and empowered in your own care and, and feel like you're you're aware of what's going on without somebody else, without that clinical team, without us just sort of taking the reins and, and sort of directing and, and you know, telling you take these drops and have this surgery. It's really important for me that patients feel involved and, and know what's going on for them. So in terms of the education side of things, this nine categories of health education needs the list on this slide actually came from patients. It came from qualitative research interviews with our patients who were more newly diagnosed. Try and ascertain what information was required to help patients be more involved in their care and help them adhere to drop regimes because obviously for most patients who are newly diagnosed unless they come to us a little more advanced we tend to be prescribing drops for them in the first instance. So these education needs that were flagged, I would say definitely still come up, although this research was done some time ago, these are you know, consistent. And often when I'm looking to talk to patients about glaucoma, these are the things that I will always make sure I cover. So patients wanted to understand what glaucoma is, what their individual diagnosis is, and obviously what that means to them. The way we would treat a patient with um, a normal tension glaucoma may be slightly different. We may do a few more investigations than patients who have a very high pressure. Again, open and closed angle glaucoma, there are differences there, your secondary glaucomas. And so whilst there may be common themes in treatments, we certainly would say it's good to know what your diagnosis is, what that then means for you and why you're being prescribed a particular treatment. And then when it comes to the treatments, what are we aiming to do with them? So with the eye drops, for example, patients want to know what are the potential side effects? What is this eye drop doing for my eye? How is it working? What is the pressure reducing effect of it? How do we know if that's enough? Same thing for any laser or surgical interventions. How do I know whether this has been successful? What are the follow-ups like? What are the potential complications? And so it's about giving the right amount of information for patients to feel truly involved and that they, they feel happy, they know what's happening. And obviously what they can do to sort of get the best outcomes. People therefore wanted to feel confident putting in the eye drops. It's really important if we're saying this is your treatment and we're relying upon you to put this drop in, that you can do it. So a huge part of my role is, is drop assessments and trying to teach different techniques, trying to get around problems patients may have with instilling their eye drops, whether that's new techniques, drop aids. It might not be the practicalities even. Often it's difficult to fit it into a routine and some people are on shifts, they have children, family members, they're caring for a, a busy work life. It may be difficult to just literally fit that drop regime into what they're doing day to day. And so it's trying to cover all of those problems that, that rise from, from the fact that we're making you put drops in at regular times or asking you to. Often it's about putting things in perspective. So I, you know, Owen was mentioning, you know, we do try and, and sort of 
give people a sense of if we can get on top of this, then a lot of people do retain really good vision. Most people do. Um, and obviously the idea of us never discharging you and you remaining in our service means that we're constantly keeping a check up on that. Um, so it's about putting it into perspective and, and sort of encouraging patients to ask questions about their condition, ask the, the questions of the clinical team that they're seeing and make sure that they're happy that they know things are stable and if they're not stable, what's happening and, and what the plan is. Um, in terms of navigating the healthcare system, again, that's all tied in. It's making sure patients know how to access the people they need to, even if that's just having my number, I find that's really useful because then if they do have any questions or concerns, I'm often that central point that can speak to all the other members of the team and outside services. Um, and so it's about navigating that healthcare system and where to access other good sources of information. Again, I can direct, but often I am directing patients to our ECLO services, to Glaucoma UK. Um, and so these were the, the common themes that, that sort of came up from this research and that still tend to come up. In terms of support, I find that education support were obviously a little bit intertwined, but I've tried to list a few categories here to sort of create those common themes. Um, Support can relate to all kinds of, of different things, again, at various stages. Now, when we're thinking about things like emotional support, um, I would say that that could be at any point, and, and it may be to varying degrees. Some patients will really struggle just purely with a diagnosis, and they may have um, great vision at that point. They may be even very low risk, but it's just the, the idea of the unknown and being referred into a new service and being told you have a condition. So a lot of patients may need support at that early stage. Some patients may be fine at that point, but need support later on because of either reduction in vision, changes to vision, anxiety about treatments, worries about surgical intervention or complications, symptoms they're having. Um, and the, the levels will be different. We do sometimes refer people on to other services. People may need more formal counselling. Some people are going through a bereavement process of changes to vision, etc. Um, or it may just be that they need a little bit of a chat with me, know that that support is there if they need it. Again, practicalities, often people go to the idea of vision loss and, and practical aspects of how to make the most of existing vision where to access, uh, you know, help with mobility, help with you know, digital tech, et cetera. But it may just be the practical aspects of what does this diagnosis mean? Um, so in those cases, it may be that patients want to know, well, when do I contact DVLA? Um, what can I do? Owen has, has touched upon some of those um, sort of questions that we often get about what can I do to help myself? And a lot of it is really just trying to lead a, lead a healthy life and you know, getting good nutrition and, and regular exercise and adhering to the drops, making sure you let us know if there's any problems at all that you notice being aware of possible symptoms. Um, but it's about knowing that that, that information is, is sort of what we would give and what to do if you do have questions and where to go for that advice. Social support, Owen again has touched upon, really important. Um, it's, it's good to speak to your clinical team, but often I find I am referring patients on to other services that will provide that peer support or trying to engage um, that peer support within our own services with our groups that we do. Um, because it is a bit different when you speak into a clinician and, and often I find that um, there's limited time, which is why my role is, is so great, because I do get a bit longer with patients, but also it's not the same speaking to somebody who is from a clinical background. Um, it's, it's much easier in some ways to speak to a patient and, and hear their experience because it, there's that similar, common, similar commonality there. Um, I haven't had glaucoma surgery myself. I have to hold my hand up and say, of course, I don't have glaucoma. So you know, often it's just getting that different perspective of another patient who maybe have been through a similar experience to just encourage that there is a way to sort of live with glaucoma quite well and, and give those tips and tricks and, and ask those questions of someone else who's maybe been through a similar experience. Technology and practical aids, again, are great. And I've mentioned about the idea of um, apps that, that are being used to help with diagnosis and monitoring, um, but also things like this, webinars, podcast videos, often patients are coming to me to find out how to access information and, and what's available out there. 
Um, and again, in terms of financial help and employment and education, there's loads of support out there and, and usually that's accessed via ECLOS and other ophthalmic charities. Um, but again, it's about just in, encouraging people to, to let us know if they are struggling with any particular area and then we can put patients in contact with the right services to get that support. I just wanted to touch upon, you know, sort of that a big overview of the types of things that I cover with my patients, but I really wanted to touch upon how it works clinically with our services before I sort of uh, pass back to Joe, because I know that this is often a big worry with patients and because I'm here as a clinician, it may be a bit easier to try and explain how we do things at Manchester, because I've no doubt that most hospitals will have a, a very similar setup. So. In terms of the, the actual follow-ups with our patients and, and how it works with who you see, um, it's good to try and get a sense of, of what that's like and why we do what we do and, and why you may have um, certain lengths between appointments. So everything we do at Manchester is risk stratified. And what that means is that anybody who is a lower risk category of patients, so often that a patient with glaucoma suspect, not truly a glaucoma diagnosis yet, or ocular hypertensives, very low risk patient groups, they're often seen in our virtual clinics where you come and you have the vision check, you have uh, intraocular pressure check, you have the imaging of the nerve at the back of the eye, and you have the field test to check peripheral vision, and a few questions are asked to make sure you're managing with treatment, etc. And then that's reviewed by the clinical team, we usually write to you to say this is what's happening, things are stable, or we'd like to see you a bit sooner. And often that works really well because we don't need to see this patient group as often. And that's great because that means that things are stable. That's why we don't need to see them as much. Um, medium risk group for us, were usually seen by our optometrists within our service. And these are specially trained optometrists in glaucoma that have been trained by the hospital. The benefit of seeing this group of, of clinicians is the optometrist similar to myself, we don't rotate around different specialities. We're solely with that glaucoma team. We're not moving on. We're not there for a short period. Um, and obviously it means that we get to know the system and get to know our patients and know glaucoma really, really well. Um, so our optometrists will see our medium risk patients, those that aren't having surgical intervention that require regular follow-ups between sort of six months to a year, sometimes a bit sooner. And they also see all of our new patients. And Owen's touched upon how it works or how, how it's starting to work in Wales in terms of the community optometrists seeing patients before they're referred on to the hospital. And we already have that system in place at Manchester. Um, so we have a referral refinement system. So again, we have specially trained optometrists in the community who will assess patients who have been seen by their regular community optometrists before they come to the hospital. And that means we can ensure that the patients coming through, as, as Owen's alluded to, really does help with reducing patients coming through to the service that actually need to be seen as opposed to the ones that don't. So we already have that in place and some of the community optometrists that do that are actually going to start seeing our low risk patients as well. And then the more high risk patients, which are our complex glaucomas, patients with other ophthalmic or systemic conditions that may be impacting their glaucoma, advanced glaucoma, surgical interventions, they're seen by a consultant-led team. But again, um, the consultant-led team will include optometrists, nurses like myself. I do see patients on the consultant-led clinics. But what it means is, although somebody else may see you and review you on that slip lamp, for our patients, they're still getting that consultant input because the consultant is always there. We need our surgical team to obviously advise on our surgical patients. Um, but what it means is that hopefully then we can see people under the, the right sort of care of, of whichever clinician they need to see at the right time. I would say COVID has obviously thrown things out a lot. There are huge backlogs in every hospital, but there are ways that things are moving forward, albeit a, a little slower than I personally would like, because I'm well aware that um, you know, we want to see our patients as often as we can. Um, and things like involving the community optometrists are really, really helpful. And again, as Owen's mentioned, they have that link with the hospital. We, again, in Manchester, have that same technology that we're talking about in Wales, where they can actually send us images. And so you're still under the care for our patient group, still under the care of our glaucoma team that's based at Manchester, except we're just accessing those other specialists in glaucoma to help us to manage our patient load so people are waiting a, a lot less. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sort of overview. Thank you for listening. I'll hand back to Joe because I've taken enough of your time and we'll see what the, the questions and answers bring as well. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was really interesting and a really, really helpful oversight of both the everything that's happening in Manchester and, and how nurses can help. So um, we will hand over to, to you guys now for your, for your Q&A. So don't forget the Q&A box. If you click on that, you can type in any questions that you have at all about, about glaucoma, about living with the condition, about anything that's come up um, through Owen and Rachel's um, talks. We've also got Trish on hand, who, as I said, is one of our helpline advisors. So I'll sort of direct the question to, to the person who I think um, might be best placed. But obviously, Owen, Rachel and Trish, it'd be great if you all sort of chip in and contribute. I'm sure you all have, have lots to say for a few of the questions. So we had some questions sent through in advance. I'm going to start with a really, really common question. And I might um, send this to Rachel first. So. How do you come across patients who suffer side effects with eye drops and what would you do to help them? Yes, I, I, I mean, as awful as it sounds, so don't let this worry anybody, but it's really common. But bear in mind, it's really common for me to encounter this because we have so many patients, <laughs> but a huge uh, sort of number of calls that I get to me are worries about side effects from eye drops. Now, it's not always the eye drops themselves. Quite often we find that preservatives are an issue for some of our patients so that they can cause some irritation to the ocular surface. So, you know, those sort of dry eye symptoms, feeling gritty, irritable. Sometimes it's the skin around the eye. Um, often it may be the preservative. Sometimes it can be the drug itself. So that's a really common one. And there are ways around it. We can either get on preservative free drops or it may be that we even, even have to switch to a different drop either a different drug group and obviously I'd speak to my clinical team about that and again it would be seeing if those side effects um, sort of subside so that kind of ocular irritation is a common one bear in mind though I always say to patients if you get a bit of that on installation that can be quite normal a lot of the drops do sting when you put them in it's when it's persistent and we find that those sort of symptoms are not going away and they're there throughout the day and, and they just sort of never never disappear Unfortunately, a lot of our drops can cause or exacerbate some dry eye symptoms. So if you're prone to a bit of dryness on the ocular surface anyway, it may not be you know, a side effect as such of the drop that you've got a complete intolerance to it. It may just be that the, the dry eye symptoms have increased. So again, we might just be recommending extra lubricants for the eye and seeing if that helps. Some drops will cause side effects or can cause side effects that we definitely want to address. So things like your beta blockers may cause issues with breathing if you already have some breathing problems. Some people can feel quite fatigued on them. And we won't get this with every patient, but I just make sure that I say to everybody, often I do encounter patients that have been started on a new drop and we're doing that checkup, are they managing okay? Just say, please let us know if you're worried that there are new side effects, new things that have arisen that you're not sure if it's a drop or not, just tell us what they are and we can monitor it. Often, as I say, we're either having to stop that drop and switch to something new um, or just assess whether or not it could be something else that's causing those problems. If we're absolutely sure it's not the drop, we'd obviously say check in with the GP because some things may not be the drops at all, but until you tell us, we don't know what's going on. So definitely, definitely, whatever hospital team you're under I'm sure they would say exactly the same thing if you're worried it's a side effect even if we're not sure ask your clinical team just let them know how long you've been experiencing whatever it is and they'll be able to tell you whether that is something they potentially could expect from the drop and what we do from there um, but it just depends on what it is really great thanks so there's lots you can do and you've sort of suggested maybe keeping track so possibly kind of making notes every time you put in the drops if you are getting side effects Trish is there anything you'd, you'd want to add to that? I mean, obviously, if you encourage them to do the punctured occlusion, like once they put the drop in to close their eyes and press on their tear duct up to two minutes, that can reduce the amount of drop that can get into the back of the throat, into the bloodstream via the tear duct. And that can stop some of the side effects from happening or at least deter them from happening slightly. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you. And so linked to that, Rachel, you mentioned dry eye. And Owen, we've, we've had a question specifically to you about dry eye. So do you get dry eyes, particularly if you do screen work? And how do you avoid it or treat it? I have had dry eyes, yes. And I do get it quite often. Um, I, I'm not taking, as Rachel talked about, um, um, drops or artificial tears. The way I try and combat against it, because I do do a lot of, of screen work, is to take regular breaks. So I, I do find that 
you know, I, I'll try not to work in front of the computer for, you know, hours after hours. I'll get up, I'll walk around, I'll make a cup of tea. Um, the nice thing about working at home is that if I have some phone calls to make, I'll do them away from the computer. I'll actually literally go away. And if even if it's sitting in the other room or lying on the bed to make that phone call. So for me, it's about taking regular breaks. Definitely, yeah. And, and Rachel, is there anything you could say about the the lubricating eye drops? Sort of how do people get hold of them? How often so, do they put them in? Yeah, most of the time we tend to advise you can just go to see your pharmacist or go to your GP and, and get any of the, the lubricating eye drops that you can get over the counter. You will find sometimes the clinical teams will suggest a particular one. That maybe comes from if we know you've tried other things and we're, we're tending to sort of want to go to the sort of top end of, of what we think tends to work for our patients. Again, if someone has persistent real difficulties with dry eye, we would refer to our, our corneal specialist so that they can address any sort of severe dry eye symptoms. But yeah, usually accessing it by your pharmacy or your GP, they'll be able to tell you what's available. Try one of them. What I find is that even though I could say, well, I think a lot of people, you know, get relief from this particular lubricant, it really varies. So whatever works for you, if you find that it works, then, then go for it, keep using it. The main thing would be just don't put those lubricants in and wash away your, your glaucoma drops. So leave those gaps between drops. Um, obviously, if you're using anything that's a, a thicker lubricating uh, sort of gel or ointment, which tends to be prescribed for nighttime use, they can work really well. But bear in mind, once that's gone in, it can blur your vision a little bit. That's why they tend to say use them the night before bed. And again, because it's a lot thicker, you'll find it difficult to get a drop in afterwards. So it's more about if you are adding lubricants into any existing drop regime, make sure that you're really vigilant with your glaucoma ones. You're not washing them out or stopping them from going in. Um, the, the lubricating side of things is great, but also some people do need a bit of, of blepharitis treatment as in warm compresses to the eye, keeping the, the lids clean, getting those glands opened up that are on the eyelids that help with the tear film. So sometimes you'll find your clinical team will recommend that. So warm compresses, lid hygiene, bit of lid massage. I said that's really to get your tear film working as, as good as it can do and, and open up those glands on your lids. Lovely, thank you. And maybe one for Trish. Is there a limit as to how often you can put those lubricating eye drops in? No, I mean, they are just literally lubricants for the eye. I'm sure Rachel will agree with me. And basically, if if they say use them, some people say oh, I only use them two or three times a day, but sometimes that isn't enough and they do suffer as the day goes on. They notice their vision is blurred. So use them as often as you feel like. If you feel like you need to use them at least five times a day, use them at least five times a day if you feel the benefits of it. But obviously make sure that you leave a, a big gap between putting them in and putting your glaucoma drops in leave at least 20 minutes for you know either way but um but yeah they can use it as often as they feel like they need to I would think yeah and actually Trish you've just mentioned try and use it really as frequently as you regularly need to but keep that up because what we find is we get some relief for some patients and they say we've well, been putting it in say six times a day then they reduce it and then the dry eye symptoms come back so it's about just staying on top of it so yeah. if, you know really if you found it works with you putting it in that many times keep that up because otherwise it's going to creep back again and we're back to square one yeah, yeah. great thank you so um a, another question which is had a like as well so having had two acreage shunt operations which seem fine i wonder if all the pre and post-op worries may be helped by better written information so it would be good to know about what's normal to expect and what's important to report. So, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, definitely. Yeah, it's this is a big um, bugbear for me because, and I'm actually trying to get more involved with our surgical side because of this. I've found that. Um, you know with all due respect to our clinical team you know and I'm one of them they're very very busy and they have limited time and I find that sometimes even if you do get the written information it doesn't answer every question that you might have and it doesn't necessarily just magic those anxieties away so I think um, you know it, it's really really important some things that perhaps the clinical team won't necessarily think to say aren't then addressed and, and it's important then for patients to know where to go if they suddenly do have a question and I think there's this key things that you know I've noticed from the more I've done with surgical patient groups since you know my roles developed 
of just little things that that we could say and advise that are actually really helpful such as you are, for a lot of our patients we give you a dilating drop on the table when you're having the surgery but also we tend to keep you on it to begin with for the first sort of you know few weeks or so and that will make your pupil big so obviously the eye looks different also it blurs the vision that on its own and often that's just not mentioned because it's just part of that sort of system of how we do things but I found when I've said this to patients it's been a big relief to know well my eye looks a bit strange but that's normal my vision's blurred but that's normal because of just this one drop so it's those types of things that I think definitely you know the more we can information we can give people the more it reduces that anxiety and some of it is missing I think and, and every hospital be different but definitely it's something I want to work on at hours because I'm, I'm noticing it more and more also remember we have a buddy system so if someone is due to have surgery done and um, they can phone us and we can put them in contact with the buddy so they can discuss with them any worries concerns trepidation they have about having the surgery done so they can speak to them about their pre-op the actual op and the post-op and some buddies actually do keep in touch as well even after the surgery to tell them how they're getting on so it's always good to know that you can actually speak to someone who's actually had the procedure done so they know exactly how you're feeling well, I think that buddy scheme is, is fantastic, actually, because it is, you know, the biggest thing about anxiety is just not knowing. So if someone's gone through it, you can talk to them about that. Going back to the information resource, I, I, I completely agree. I, I, I have the, the, the you know, the, the, the surgical team within Cardiff were absolutely fantastic with me, but I didn't get an, uh, anything around information, um, uh, you know, at, at after surgery. So I I, one of the things we're trying to do, and maybe it's something that Oklahoma UK can look into, I'm sure as patients, we will have, um, we've, we've learned things now that we would have liked to have known previously. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity here to design a patient leaflet, that, you know, a leaflet that's actually designed by patients themselves around all the useful information that we've learned Um you know, maybe through Glaucoma UK, maybe from just trial and error ourselves or through other practitioners like Rachel, um, so that you have a really meaningful leaflet that is designed by patients with, with glaucoma. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a great point. We're actually in the process of um, rewriting our leaflets at the moment because we recognise some of the information is a bit too, a bit complicated, a bit clinical, and it's not yeah. necessarily written with the with the patient in mind so that's a very timely suggestion Owen thank you we'll, we'll still have a think about that a kind of things I wish I'd known type yeah yeah exactly that and yeah. um, that we, we could sort of harness from our from our members and supporters um, and make sure those leaflets and that information is really really helpful just I mean, another important, so I was going to say important things you know I, I know of one case where a couple of cases where people have, have had to cancel appointments and, and sort of thought, well, I, maybe I don't need to take my drops now. So, you know, importance of keep taking your drops, always keep taking your drops. If you've had a cancel appointment, don't see that as a, a reason to stop taking them. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Just in terms of um, wanting to access sort of other people who have glaucoma, we, um, we have our health unlocked forum. Um, and that's where people, lots of people with glaucoma are sort of posting their questions and comments. Mm and things on there um so if you if you do have questions and you want to talk to someone who has glaucoma then um don't forget to use that if you want more information about it it's all on our website or you can call our helpline and it's a really nice way that that forum's getting busier and busier we're getting more and more interactions and all the comments on there are really supportive you know people are very keen to help other people and um, you know if they've been through surgery they want to share the insights they've got so there are there are means for you if you're if you're due to have surgery um, or you're worried about any aspect of, of your glaucoma, you can go on House Unlocked and, and you can reach people there who, who have the condition and maybe can, can give you their information and advice. Uh, great, a few more questions. So um, we've talked a bit about anxiety and we've got a post here that says, I've recently been diagnosed and I've already lost sight in my left eye. I find myself having regular anxiety attacks. So is that something I mean, that you've ever experienced what can you suggest to sort of help people with with anxiety about their glaucoma i've not experienced anxiety attacks but there's no doubt about anxiety around uh, my sight and, and and particularly i will say particularly after the detached retinal sur surgery it's probably the most emotional i've been um with my sight loss and and for someone who's had sight loss all my all my life 
um there were times where you know i was i, I actually you know drawn to tears um and that's not that's not like me so clearly yes it's had a, a very emotional impact on me when i was first you know first had that surgery and the impact of, uh, of the glaucoma um after that talk the one thing i would say around any anxiety talk to someone talk to your loved ones uh, talk to friends just get it off your chest share it with people um and if you have so that's just around your own anxieties if you have any anxieties around the treatment or, or whether you're worried that it's you know, what you're doing is not working and it's deteriorating talk to your consultant talk to your optician um don't don't bottle it up talk to as many people as you possibly can yeah 100% yeah and and you can get referred we can refer for more formal counseling if someone was really struggling or obviously speaking to the GP if you're really struggling with those specific anxiety attacks because you know, they can be really debilitating really overwhelming and it may be that you need that extra sort of talking therapy support or GP support input um, but as Owen said it's just talking to somebody and not you know thinking well we'll just leave this and I'll just get on with it because it is difficult you know a lot of people do struggle at various stages and just having somebody to talk to obviously for my patients you know I'd say I'm always here but it, sometimes it's, it's much easier to talk to someone completely impartial and so that's why again some referrals work really nicely to be able to talk to someone who's nothing to do with eyes or you know your family members or anything. Lovely. Thank you so much. Yeah. And our helpline is obviously available as well um, to talk to. We're open sort of during office hours and um, our advice is really good at helping people with, with glaucoma linked anxiety, any concerns, you know, there's no question too silly. Um, they've probably heard it all before, you know, it's all completely, you know, these, these, these uh, concerns and anxieties are, are, are very common and, and don't, yeah, don't bottle it up with what we're here to help with. So another, a, a really tricky question that we've had, um, what can you do if you have no nurse specialist and the health authority doesn't provide any information or support? What would you suggest there, Rachel? So it depends on who is there. So obviously I'm, I'm talking about me rather selfishly saying, I, you know, I exist. And, but there are loads of other really competent, wonderful healthcare professionals. But yes, provision is going to be different in every hospital. So it depends on who is there and what their role is. So, you know, for us in our hospital, it isn't just me. We've got a huge team. So certainly it depends on what the issues are, but definitely flag it up to the clinical team for you know any concerns you have about anything related to education support. They should be doing that role, um, you know, in place of there being a specialist nurse. It should still be there for patients to access. It's just that, you know, in our hospital or any hospital where you've got a specialist nurse, inevitably we get a little more time and, and I'm there to fulfill a specific need. Um, Echoes, again, provision is, is so they're the eye clinic days and office offices. Provision is, is sort of different all over the place, but your ECLOs will always be there potentially as well as extra support. Your optometry team, again, it really depends on, on what the query is and the concern is. But again, Glaucoma UK, any of the ophthalmic charities, I would certainly say tap into because I know that you might have specific clinical questions, but what I've noticed is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe and Trish, but what I've noticed is any of the ophthalmic charities really really good at sort of yes the general information but helping you to navigate your own healthcare system to get that support so it kind of depends on on what's what's sort of missing there you know what what it is you need from that service but don't think just because there's not a specialist nurse that you can't get it at all it just might mean accessing either outside services you know the support charities or someone else that's clinical within that same service that will be fulfilling the same sort of jobs that I do if you like. Lovely, thank you. Um, Trish, Owen, is there anything else that you'd, you'd particularly like to add? And to echo yeah. what Rachel said, I mean, we've got eye care, eye care liaison officers in, in glaucoma clinics across Wales and, and obviously uh, 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 in other areas of the UK. So ask when you go to the appointment, is there an echo you can talk to? Um, but, but yeah, use Glaucoma UK, you know, look at the information that's available. Also local sight loss charities are aware of, of, of the pathway. So even if you've got a local sight loss charity, you might know where they are pop in and see them or speak to them and they'll direct you to relevant uh, information resources. Lovely. Thank you. Right, we're running out of time. We've got one more minute. So I'm just going to launch our second poll now, which is um, to see sort of how much you, you feel you've learned over the course of this webinar. I'm just going to launch that um, and keep that up to the end of the session. Um, so final question. We get quite a lot of questions about eye drops. Um, 
this question is, I take post-op twice daily with a 12 hour gap and latanoplast nightly. What would be the consequence of accidentally taking the COSOP drop twice within a couple of hours? I don't know whether, yeah, Rachel. Is it in, so is in taking the COSOP and then just taking another one two hours later and not taking the later one? Yeah. I mean, basically it's designed, so you have to think about whenever the, and this is from the pharmacist perspective, so I'm obviously not inventing that drug, but they've designed it in a way that hopefully that drug is going to be effective for X amount of time. So with something like your COSOP, the reason we say take 12 hours apart, we're trying to give you that 24 hour cover. So the problem with taking them too close together is that you've then got that drug metabolizing in your body, working its way through its system, doing what it needs to do to reduce your eye pressure, but then being less effective as time goes on. So if you've not had that 12 hour gap, you've got longer of that drop not working and, and reducing the pressure. So it's important to try and stick to those timings. And this is again why we would say, try and put your latanoprost in the same time every day. Although you're putting it once a day, try and stick to roughly the same time. It's all about giving you that maximal effect of the drug. And if it's not going in with those intervals, then we, we don't know what's happening after your body's metabolized it, the pressure could be going up again. So the consequences we wouldn't know for definite until we saw you but obviously this is why we try and say be really vigilant with it and try and get into that routine and, and, and try and make sure that you do tell us if there's problems with fitting it into a routine so some patients will do things like that because they literally can't stick to those timings but if you let your clinical team know then that's what they should be addressing with you and, and you know and finding ways around it Lovely, thank you. And Trish, last bit then before we before we close. So, what advice would you give to someone who's struggling to keep track of, of when they're doing their drops? How do you, how can you help people with that? Um, sometimes we say to people they can put if they have a mobile phone they can put an alarm on their phone, and we also offer um, a calendar that people can download from our website, or they can well normally if we were in the office we could print one off for them and send it to them, but they can stick it on the door of their fridge or whatever cupboard they leave their drops in. Um, and then once they've taken the drop, they can tick it. So, and they know then that in 12 hours time, they can, they need to take the other drop again. But what always surprises me though, is how many patients don't know they have to leave a gap. They have to space it out over 24 hours. But the way we always describe it is, is that if you want antibiotics, you'd have to space them out. And the eye drops are a medication. So you need to space them out, you know? So it's, I think more education for people in regard to how often they should put their drops in on a daily basis needs to be addressed, maybe sometimes in some hospitals, because they're not all being told. I agree with that. And I just think the other thing is, bear in mind, your drugs may be doing a different action on the eye as well. So just because you have one drug going in at one time and another one, they're not just totally replaceable for each other. So you have some drops that actually reduce the amount of fluid within the eye to reduce the pressure and some drops are sort of opening up the drainage channel. So, you know, you may be on a combination of different drops doing different things to help your pressure come down. So they're not just interchangeable for those reasons as well. So that's why it's certain drops at certain times. Lovely. Right. We've overrun, so I don't want to I don't want to take up any more of everyone's precious time. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to um, uh, answer your question. We've just had too many, um, too many questions. It's been too busy. Um, uh, sorry, I might just share the screen. Um, yeah, it's been too busy. I'm really sorry if we haven't answered your question. We will. Um, you can call our helpline if you have any questions at all, um, and they can they can answer your questions. Um, they're still available office hours, so please do call. Our uh, Next talk is on the 19th of May at 7 p.m. It's called Glaucoma in Focus, and it's all about a particular type of glaucoma called pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. We have another two talks planned in June, uh, one about sort of modeling glaucoma research and another one about childhood glaucomas. And then we'll be taking a bit of a gap over the summer just so you kind of know our plans. So they're all, all the events are listed on our um, on our webpage, you can call our helpline if you want any more information. So thank you so much, Rachel, Owen and Trish. It's been really interesting. Um, I really hope everyone's enjoyed it. We have a survey that's going to launch that will help us to kind of understand how, how effective you find these tips and how we can improve them. So please do take some time to um, complete that survey. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I've really enjoyed the talk and um, hopefully see you at future events.